Hi and welcome back to program analysis. This is video number four of this uh, lecture on call graph analysis where we look into a fifth and final way of constructing uh, call graphs, namely the Spark framework. The Spark framework brings in two interesting ideas. One of them is that you can see many different algorithms for constructing call graphs as instances of a single unifying framework. In particular, um, the RTA, DTA and VTA algorithms that we've seen in previous videos of this lecture can actually be seen as an instance of this Spark framework. So for any of these algorithms, um, the general recipe to construct a call graph is the following. So at first, the analysis builds a graph representation of the code, which is called the pointer assignment graph. And we'll see in a second um, what exactly that is. And then it's propagating information through this graph, which essentially, uh, which eventually will tell the analysis um, where the um, um, what types particular variables may have, and as a result also where the calls on these objects may actually go. And then the second idea that Spark brings in is that it's not just doing call graph construction, but at the same time um, is uh, performing a points to analysis, which is an analysis that reasons about the objects that a variable may refer to. And we'll see in a second why this is a good idea, because um, constructing a call graph and reasoning about points to information at the same time allows the analysis to get a more precise call graph at the end. So let's start by looking at this pointer assignment graph, which is at the basis of the Spark framework. So as every graph, um, it consists of nodes and edges. And here you see a summary of what these nodes and edges are about. So there are nodes to represent allocations, variables, and field references. And the edges correspond to allocations that are assigned to something, assignments between variables, and also field stores and field loads. So let's go through those um, in some more detail. And let's start with the um, allocation node. So there's one such node for every um, location in the program where some constructor is called. So these um, constructor calls are called allocation sites and therefore these nodes are called allocation nodes. And then what this node represent, represents is the set of objects that are created at this code location. So even if this code location may be reached multiple times in the program, for example, because it is in a loop, um, all the objects that may be created at this location are represented by this one node. And very often um, this node also has, um, not very often, actually always this node has an associated type because you know what um, constructor is called here. So you know that this type, in this case A, is the type that the um, objects represented by this node must have. So in the graph representation, we will basically see nodes that look like this um, um, and that are marked with some um, allocation sites. So some location in the code where you have a call to new some constructor name. The second kind of node are variable nodes, which, as the name suggests, can represent local variables, but they can also represent a couple of other things. Um, for example, parameters, which are very similar to local variables, and static fields, which um, you can see as a kind of global variable. And they are also used to represent thrown exceptions, which is basically to handle this special case of the Java language. What these variable nodes represent um, is a memory location that is holding a pointer or maybe multiple pointers um, during the execution of a program to objects. Um, so um, this node down here that represents the variable p will represent all the pointers to objects that this variable may ever hold during the execution of the program. And depending on what setting um, is used when using the Spark framework, these nodes may be typed um, or not. The third and final kind of node are nodes for field references. So for every um, place in the program where a field is used, so we, where we write something like p.f, um, there is such a node. And this node then represents the point that you reference that happens when this field reference is actually um, executed. Because every field is uh, in some object and there always is a base object when you um, have a field reference, these um, nodes always have a variable node as their base. So for the example of p.f, this would be the node that represents p. And then to order, um, sorry, to model um, arrays in the Java language, um, these um, field reference nodes are also used. 
um, where um, there's basically an imaginary um, field called elements, which represents all the elements that an array can have. All right, let's now look at the edges that we can have in this graph. So the first of them, um, the first edge is an allocation edge, which basically represents the fact that some newly allocated object is assigned to a variable. So if we have a piece of code that looks like this, where we say new hash map and create a new object and then assign it to a variable P, then we will get um, some graph representation that looks like this, where alloc1 is the allocation site where the new hash map constructor is called and p is the variable node that represents the variable p and we have this edge here in between because this newly allocated object is assigned to p. Um, similar, the same will happen if we do not explicitly call a constructor but create an object for example like this where um, a, string, a string literal is used which also creates a string object. Um, the assignment nodes um, are similar in the sense that they also represent um, a data flow from one um, field or variable to another. So whenever there's an assignment from a variable to a variable or from a field to a variable or a variable to a field or maybe a field to a field, um, one of these edges is used. So if, for example, we have an assignment between two variables like this, then we will have a corresponding edge that says that um, there is a flow from P to Q. Um, if we have fields involved, like in this one, then the um, corresponding nodes may just be field reference nodes, um, similar here where we're assigning the value of a field into um, a, a variable. Oh, and actually this should be uh, Q. So let's illustrate these ideas um, using a concrete example, um, which um, is these, uh, yeah, this piece of code here where we have two um, static methods. So in this example, we have three classes, A, B, and C, where um, A and B are both subclasses of C. And um, yeah, we have two allocation sites where new instances of A and B um, are created. And then we have a couple of more variables here, Q, which um, holds um, the value P at some point, um, and also T, which gets um, the return value of this bar method down here. And we also have some fields. So we know that P has a field which will get the value that is in R. And um, the um, argument that is passed into bar also has a field F, which is then actually returned and then um, eventually assigned here to uh, T. And now in order to find out where this call of T.M will actually go, um, we now need to reason about the um, different variables and their types. And then at the end also about this call. So let's do this by um, looking at the pointer assignment graph that Spark will create for this uh, little program. So we will have nodes for the different allocations here. So there will be one, oh sorry, one node for the um, allocation side one, which is this call of new A. And there will be another call, uh, another node for this allocation side two, which is the call of new B. Then we will have nodes for all the different variables. So one for P, one for Q, one for S, um, another one for R, and also one for T. And then we will also have nodes for all the field references that we have in this program, where one of them is um, P.F and the other one is S.F. Now we have the nodes. Next, we will also add edges between these nodes, where um, we'll have different kinds of edges. Um, these allocation edges here that basically tell us that these newly allocated objects are stored into P and R. Then we have some assignment edges, for example, one here that tells us that Q is assigned, no, sorry, P is assigned to Q. And another one here that tells us that Q is assigned to S. And this is um, based on the information that the bar method is called here where the Q object is actually passed to, um, to S. Um, yeah, and then we also have some edges um, on the other side here, one for this assignment of R to the field P.F. And then based on the return value that is returned by bar, we also have an assignment edge that tells us that S.F um, will be assigned to T. So now given this graph, um, we unfortunately still don't really know anything about this call of t.m down here. 
And the reason is that um, we do not really have any connection in the graph from one of the allocation sites where we know something about the types to this um, node that represents T down here. And this is actually um, what we'll need the points to, points to analysis for. So let's first have a look at points to sets and points to analysis in general, and then we'll get back to this example to see how it helps to find out where this call of t.m is actually going. So what is, does a points to analysis do? Well, it's essentially computing points to sets, which are sets of objects that a variable may refer to. So every variable will have a points to set, which um, tells us uh, about all the objects that um, this variable may point to, so that the objects um, here are represented as uh, allocation nodes. So it's not really the runtime objects, but a static abstraction of these objects, which are um, based on the allocation nodes. So as a simple example, let's assume we have um, two allocation nodes like this, where we um, instantiate classes X and Y um, in different locations of the code and both times write it um, into the same variable A then what the points to analysis will tell us is that the points to set of this variable A contains these two allocation nodes. And because we do know um, the types of each of these allocations, because we know what constructor is called, from this we can easily um, see that um, the variable A may have um, types X and Y. One important question when computing these points to sets is how to actually reason about um, allocation and assignment edges. So, and the answer that um, we give here in the context of this lecture is that we look at a so-called subset based analysis. What this means is that every allocation or assignment edge induces a subset constraint instead of um, an equality constraint, which would be um, the other option. Um, what this concretely means is that if in our graph we have um, an allocation edge uh, or an assignment edge that looks like this. So here we say that this object allocated at allocation site one is assigned to some variable P. Then this, is, then this induces a constraint that tells us that alloc one, this allocation site must be um, in the set of the, um, in the points to set of P, but it does not say that the points to set of P is equal to this um, set of this allocation site one. And the reason why we use um, a subset based analysis here um, is very simple, is that um, just because we know that um, some allocation um, site um, gets assigned to a variable P, that does not mean that later we could not see um, another allocation site. So we, by using a subset based um, uh, analysis, we can basically add more allocation sites to the points to set of a variable without having to know all the assignments at once and also without having to um, draw wrong conclusions um, about the um, actual assignments that happen in the program. Note that all the analysis that we consider here are flow insensitive, which means that we do not consider the order in which statements are executed. And that means um, even if we would know, for example, that um, one assignment to P is overwritten by another one, the analysis doesn't really know this because it only sees that, hey, there are two assignments to this um, variable P, and therefore I believe that both of these values that are assigned to P may be what P actually refers to. So there is nothing like overwriting a value because the analysis is flow insensitive. So having said that, um, let's now have a look at how to actually compute the points to sets. And in order to do this, we will introduce one more node into our graph. And this is a sort of helper node that is only needed to compute the points to sets. This node is um, called the concrete fields node. And this is in order to represent all the objects that are pointed to by a particular field F. Um, so in particular, um, we will look at all the objects pointed to by field F of all objects that are created at a particular um, allocation site. So for example, such a node could look like this, where we um, say there is some allocation site, say alloc1, and every object created at this allocation site has, a, or if it has a field F, then everything that may be in this field F is represented by this node called alloc1.f. So now given this helper node and the pointer assignment graph, we can now compute the points to set for every variable in field using this algorithm that you see here. So the algorithm consists of um, two steps. One is to initialize um, some of the points to sets in the graph. 
um, by just looking at the allocation sets uh, edges. And then there's this main loop here, which is um, repeatedly um, updating the points to sets based on different edges in the graph until nothing changes anymore. So this is basically done until all the points to sets have stabilized. Let's now illustrate this algorithm using the example that we've already seen before. So on the top right, you again see the code that you've seen before. Um, on the uh, handwritten notes, you're seeing the uh, pointer assignment graph that we have constructed so far. And now we are applying this algorithm for computing the points to sets of the different um, variables and fields to this example. So the first step in the algorithm is to initialize the points to sets of variables that are involved in uh, an allocation edge. In this example here, we have two allocation edges, this and this. And what these edges tell us is that um, the variable p um, gets assigned the object created at allocation um, site alloc1. And what this tells us is that this variable may point to all of these objects that are represented by alloc1. So the um, this blue dashed edge that I'm using here, this is um, to represent the points to edges um, of, point, uh, of variables and fields. And then looking at the other allocation edge, we can basically do the same. So this second allocation tells us that um, R may refer to um, the objects allocated at alloc2. After having performed this first step, we are now entering the main loop of this algorithm, where we start with the first step, which is to propagate the sets along um, the assignment edges that we see in our graph. So we have a couple of assignment edges here. We can only propagate something if we already know something about the source of one of these assignment edges, which is the case, for example, here, because we already know um, um, something about the points to set of P and can now propagate this information because of that assignment edge to the points to set of Q, where we will now also know that um, Q may refer to objects created at alloc1. Now, after having done this, we also can uh, propagate this information along this other assignment edge down here, where we oops, um, can now um, yeah, propagate this information that Q points to alloc1 down to S by saying that also S um, is now known to refer to the objects created at alloc1. So this is all we can do for the first step in the main loop. So let's move on to step number two in this main loop, where we look into the load edges in our graph. Um, there's one such load edge, which is this one down here. Uh, now, if you would already know something about the points to um, set of S dot F, then we would propagate this into the points to set of T, but we do not yet know anything about it. And therefore, um, there's nothing we um, have to do here. Instead, the algorithm moves on to step number three in the main loop, where we will now look at store edges. In this example, we have exactly one store edge, which is this one. And what we do here is the following. So we look at um, the um, points to information of the um, variable that is stored into the field. So the points to information of R, and we know something about R, namely that it may refer to alloc2. And then we look into the um, base objects that um, uh, this P may refer to. So we look into um, basically this um, edge up here, where we see that P may refer to um, alloc1. And now our helper um, um, node that I talked about earlier comes into play, because now we are creating this helper node for alloc1 dot p, which represents all the values that the field f of an object created at alloc1 may point to. And now based on this um, helper node, what we do is the following. We now propagate the information that r may point to alloc2 to this helper node by saying that um, this, um, these fields represented by alloc1 dot f may also refer to um, alloc2. Yeah, and with this, we are done with the first iteration of this main loop and then go back to step number one in the loop. Um, there's nothing more we can propagate along assignment edges. 
But now when reaching the second step of the main loop, we can look at the um, load edge that we had already visited earlier again. And now there's actually something we can do about this. And the reason um, is the following. The algorithm now checks if it knows anything about s.f. And to do this, it looks into um, the space object and it sees that for the space object s, we actually know that it may point to alloc1. And therefore it looks into this helper node alloc1.f because f is the field that we're accessing on whatever s may point to. And therefore it'll see that alloc1.f may actually point to alloc2. And because we know this about s.f, we can now propagate this information down to t by saying that, well, if s.f can refer to alloc2, then t can now also refer to alloc2. So we now add this points to edge um, to um, alloc2 um, into our graph. And then the algorithm moves on and will essentially see that nothing changes anymore. So there are no more points to um, uh, edges that we can add to our graph and therefore um, the algorithm terminates and has computed the points to information for all the fields and variables in this example. So now the big question is of course what can we do with this information? Um, after all our goal was to compute a call graph and um, to illustrate this let's have a look at this call of t.m at the very end of our foo method and as I said earlier um, the class um, hierarchy that we assume here is that um, we have two uh, classes A and B which are both subclasses of a class C and let's just assume that each of these three classes A, B and C is um, actually offering um, a method M. So in without knowing anything else the algorithm would have to assume that T.M can either call A.M or B.M or C.M. But now based on the um, um, points to information that we have computed here. We know that T actually always can only refer to um, whatever is created at alloc2 and alloc2 uh, is known to create an object of uh, uh, type B. So what we know here is that the call goes to um, B.M and not to A.M and also not to C.M. So we have ruled out two other call edges that we would have otherwise because we have computed points to information here. So now I hope to have convinced you that um, this idea of Spark of combining uh, points to analysis with um, call graph construction is actually a good idea because it can give you a more precise call graph. The other idea that Spark had introduced was to have this generic framework that allows you to um, express different kinds of call graph analysis algorithms in more or less the same framework. And just to uh, give you a glimpse of how this could work. So if you um, now take this, um, uh, this algorithm and the, the pointer assignment graph that we've seen earlier, then you can basically um, change some details of this and then you'll get some of the other algorithms um, that we have already discussed and potentially also other variants that we are not discussing here. So one change, for example, is to, instead of having one um, uh, allocation um, node per allocation site, you can also have just one um, allocation site per type, basically conflating all the different places where the same constructor is called. Another variant is that instead of representing fields um, precisely by looking at exactly what variable a field is called on um, or is, ref uh, is, is referenced on, you can also represent fields just by their signature, meaning by um, the class name dot the field name. Um, and another variant, for example, would be to instead of um, looking at assignments in the subset manner that we've seen here to um, to do um, to yeah let them impose equality constraints which will um, be a little faster but give a less precise call graph. So in summary, let's have a look at the pros and cons of this um, Spark framework. So on the um, benefit side. Um, one benefit clearly is that it's a generic algorithm where you can tune precision and efficiency um, according to um, your wishes. So if you want to analyze a very large program, maybe you want to use a less precise call graph construction algorithm, but still be able to do the analysis. Whereas if you have a smaller program, maybe you can afford to do a more precise analysis. And um, um, to get a precise call graph, one of the key ideas in Spark is that it does 
um, points to um, set uh, computation along with the call graph uh, construction, which as we've seen can increase precision. On the downside, all of this is still flow insensitive. So the analysis still does not really look into um, the order in which statements are executed, which is something one could do, but of course would make the analysis again more expensive. But even the way it is right now, if you use all the um, features that Spark provides, it can actually get quite expensive and take a while to compute for, uh, for large programs. All right, and this is already the end of this lecture on call graph analysis. Um, I hope you now have a better idea of what a call graph actually is and how it can be computed in an object-oriented language. Um, we haven't really talked much about the applications of call graphs, but they can be used for many, many different things and are at the basis of many um, other static analyses. So for example, if you just want to know whether changing the code in one um, method may actually impact the code in some other method, then one way to do this is to look at the call graph and to see if there actually is um, an edge or maybe a transitive um, um, yeah, sequence of edges from the first method to the other method. Um, if you want to try any of these things in practice, um, I recommend to have a look at the suit framework, which implements these algorithms for Java. So if you want to just play around with it a little bit and see what kind of call graph you'll get, then you should um, have a look um, for suit. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.